I mean, I'm super impressed that you all joined us today. It's such a nice day outside. So uh, I, hopefully I'll make this well worth your time. <laughs> I'll do my best to do that. Uh, and I'll also try to keep it fairly informal. So, you know, I have some slides that I'll show and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk for a little while, but I'm hoping that you all have questions. And I think Julie agreed to kind of take a, take a look at the chat and you can post questions in the chat or you can, you know, raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask questions. That's perfectly wonderful and fine. Uh, a little bit about me, just so you know who you're, who you're talking to or who's talking to you. Um, I, as Julie mentioned, I'm a lecturer in uh, programming the environment uh, um, in both C's and uh, LSNA. And I, just a, a little bit about my career path, my trajectory. Uh, I grew up in rural Southwest Ohio, spent a lot of time outside, um, wandering around the countryside, pretty much unsupervised. And that probably, uh, I was a free range child, I think you would say, and that probably left a, a mark in terms of where my career path ended up going, although I don't know if I would have been able to predict that uh, earlier on. So uh, in undergrad, I actually focused in environmental health and safety. Um, maybe like some of you, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. So that's kind of where I ended up. It seemed like a clear kind of career path uh, that was comforting. It, my parents certainly felt better about that. Um, and I ended up working in some related fields after undergraduate, uh, but it, those fields weren't really giving me what I wanted. And I ended up coming back to the University of Michigan to do a master's in environmental education. Uh, and along, along that path, while I was learning more about environmental education and getting more immersed in that, I really became much more interested in environmental psychology. Um, for a variety of reasons. One of those was because I was able to work with some really wonderful folks. Uh, Ray DeYoung, who's here at uh, the University of Michigan was one of those, but also Stephen and Rachel Kaplan, who are um, giants in the field of environmental psychology. They were actually founders, uh, some would say, of many parts of that field and um, really came up with some really fundamental theories about how to explain why spending time in nature might be beneficial to people. So uh, that got me really much more interested in environmental psychology. And at the same time, I was kind of also interested in some issues around mindfulness and meditation. And these things kind of came together uh, in some interesting ways to get me thinking about whether or not how we interact with the environment, particularly natural environments, matters. Whether if we tuned into the environment, does that give us more benefits or change the experience for us in some beneficial way? So um that's really what my PhD focused on. Um, and since that time, right, I have done some work that has looked at green exercise. So the benefits of being physically active outdoors and whether that's different than the benefits you might get from being active indoors. I've looked at group-based um, nature recreation experiences for veterans who are returning from service and transitioning back to civilian life. and whether that helps them cope with that experience and the ways that it does that. I've looked at the use of nature to cope with uh, experiences of students during the pandemic, um, the impact of gardens and natural areas in prison environments. Uh, so those are all kind of looking at the natural environment, but um, as we'll see, as I talk more about the, the elements of environmental psychology, I'm also interested in public perceptions, uh, individual perceptions of the environment. So some of my other work looks at community perceptions of ur urban parks, you know, what they would like to see in those parks, how they experience those spaces. I've looked at how people feel about uh, resource management efforts around freshwater issues in the Great Lakes, right? So state and local agencies are trying to manage those resources. The public has uh, attitudes about them, what does that look like? Uh, and just recently, I'm working with a Pite uh, honor student on uh, public perceptions of the dioxin plume that's happening in Ann Arbor for the past 40 years. So, right, you can kind of start to get a sense of the kinds of issues that uh, in me, maybe not all environmental psychologists, but, but I'm interested in. Um, so with that, I think I'll share some slides with you and um, I'll kind of talk through 
just an overview of what environmental psychologists, uh, what it is, what psychologists do, uh, and also talk a little bit about like career trajectories, career paths within in the field and what that might look like. Um, and hopefully that'll help you get a little bit better sense from that. Let me share my screen with you. Um, and I'm also gonna share the slides. So I shared the slides in the chat. So there are some active links in some of those slides. Um, and you can click on those and they should work. So um, I can get my slides right here. So we should probably start with this question of, you know, what is environmental psychology <laughs> anyway? What is this uh, thing that we're calling environmental psychology? Uh, and I put this picture up because uh, when I tell people that I'm an environmental psychologist, uh, this is generally the first thing that they ask me. Oh, so you study people who hug trees. And uh, as you can imagine, that's slightly annoying. <laughs> but uh, there's also some truth to that. So I can't be too critical of the fact that they have some intuitive sense for what this is all about. Of course, uh, environmental psychologists are about much, much more than just you know, people that go out and hug trees and sing kumbaya in nature. Uh, what they are uh, really interested in is uh, the interrelationships that people uh, have with their surroundings. So that might explore things like uh, how people change the environment uh, and manipulate it, and also how the environment changes people how it influences their attitudes, their beliefs, uh, their behaviors, their actions in different ways. And um, environmental psychology actually is a fairly young field within psychology. So it's still kind of finding its way. It really didn't gain a lot of traction until the late 1960s, early 70s, when people started to become more aware of environmental issues um, and the impact the environment has on us. So that's uh, maybe partially an explanation for why uh, there's a variety of terms that are used within the field. So environmental psychology is kind of this broad umbrella. And then within that, there's a bunch of more uh, uh, precise or specific kind of sub fields or sub disciplines that you might also hear of. So one of those is conservation psychology. Another is eco psychology. Uh, a newer uh, idea here is the idea of climate psychology. Um, you might also sometimes hear population psychology being connected with environmental psychology, although that's kind of a tenuous connection. But um, but that's just to say that like it, there might be uh, other names for uh, the kinds of uh, things we're talking about. But what the thing to really kind of remember, keep in mind, is all of these things are really taking the position of uh, rather than focus on the individual, right? Uh, what environmental psychologists and some of these other fields are going to do is that they're going to put the environment front and center. So uh, maybe a, a way to think about that is um, obviously there are a lot of disciplines in psychology that uh, emphasize dispositional qualities right? The reason that somebody behaves a certain way or has a certain set of beliefs or attitudes says something about their personality uh, or how they were raised, right? Uh, or maybe the, the social settings that they're in. And of course, all of those things play a role and those are things are important. But, right, environmental psychologists would emphasize that the, the environments that people are immersed in, that they're interacting with, also play an enormous role. And we can illustrate this because I know every single one of you have been in situations where you have acted like a complete jerk, right? Uh, and that probably wasn't because like dispositionally you're a jerk uh, because I know you've probably also been in situations where you've acted uh, incredibly generously and uh, right. Uh, uh, and so, right, you're capable of a whole range of interactions and it may be that the environments that you're interacting with might actually reinforce or support or uh, contribute, right, to you acting in a certain way, right? And you've probably, again, you all can imagine situations where your actions, your attitudes varied depending upon elements of the environment or the setting. 
right? So that's why we are interested in uh, really focusing in on the environment. It fills in an important gap. Uh, so in the process of doing that, though, right, there are all these other interrelationships that we might want to consider and explore. So what we'll see is that environmental psychology also overlaps with and draws on a whole number of other fields or other disciplines. So it certainly uh, draws on other fields of psychology, cognitive psychology, social psychology, behavioral psychology, uh, positive psychology, organizational psychology, all of these fields overlap with elements of, of psychology. So none of these things are siloed. They all have, they all should speak to each other in different ways. Uh, because of course, like, you know, as we interact with the environment, we're constructing ideas and expectations and perceptions of that environment. So we need to understand these other processes as well. It also might overlap with and draw on some more uh, design oriented fields. So things like architecture or landscape architecture, urban planning, interior design, these are all fields that are dealing with how do we construct or build environments for people, right, that, that people inhabit. And the way that we construct them, right, might have an influence on people's uh, reactions to them, their emotional uh, feelings towards them, their actions in those settings. So uh, that, that's another field that's important to think about. And then it also is going to have impacts on uh, and draw on fields like communications, uh, education, uh, because we might have uh, messages that we want to put forward about how to act uh, in different ways in different kinds of environments, uh, public and environmental health, because again, there are health and well-being implications to environments that we spend time in, public policy, uh, because policy is about uh, uh, influencing the environment in different ways, and that has a downstream effect on people. And then also uh, natural resources management. And this is not a comprehensive list. There are certainly many other disciplines that get drawn on here. So before we go any further, it is useful to kind of spend a little bit of time focusing on what do we actually mean by an environment? Because it's often a richer space than what people initially uh, think of. So like one way to think about an environment is uh, a natural environment, right? That's probably what comes most naturally to mind. And that might be something like an urban park, right? Yeah, that's a natural space, right? That uh, people interact with in various ways. It might also be uh, a botanical garden, right? It could also be uh, a wilderness experience, right? A much more remote, removed kind of experience that we do either individually or with a group. And each of these different uh, types of nature interactions, amongst many other types, uh, might have different kinds of impacts or lead to different kinds of experiences for people. Uh, so environmental psychologists would look at all of these different uh, nature interactions, but they would also be interested in other kinds of environments as well. So uh, we would also be interested in built environments that might be, you know, Times Square, right? New York City, a heavily uh, urban, densely populated environment. So certainly the way that that uh, environment is set up and structured causes people to act in, in different kinds of ways as well. Uh, likewise, we might have residential kinds of settings, suburban settings, and how they're uh, designed and, and built and laid out. That also has implications uh, for human health and well-being and, uh, and transportation and right, all kinds of other things and social relationships. Uh, and right, we might have small kind of uh, towns. That's another kind of environment that we could look at. Uh, we could also think about interior spaces, also built spaces, retail spaces, things like uh, shopping malls, right? Might uh, use in, uh, environmental psychology to think about consumer behavior. Uh, we might think about office environments, how those spaces are structured to maybe make workers more or less productive in their jobs or more uh, likely to show up to work and be ready to, to interact and, and be uh, tuned in and capable of, of what they uh, need to accomplish. Uh, we might think about uh, healthcare settings. So in the form of hospitals or um, hospice facilities or uh, nursing homes, uh, all or uh, any kinds of uh, uh, treatment facilities, rehabilitation centers, right? Again, how those are laid out and designed uh, has an impact on the users of those spaces, both of the patients, but also the staff uh, at the hospitals themselves. 
We might also consider uh, educational settings, both uh, informal and formal educational spaces. So we might look at things like uh, children's museums, right? Well, again, the way that those uh, children's museums are structured and designed presumably have an impact on the experiences of children, their families, how much they learn, how much they gain from those experiences, how they interact with exhibits in different ways. We might uh, think about zoos and aquariums as another space, right, that's trying to provide an experience for people to connect with nature, to interact with nature, and also to communicate some environmental messages about probably conservation or, uh, or about species, right? So again, that might be a space to think about. Uh, and then it might also be formal educational settings, right? How do we uh, build and design uh, school settings, both classroom settings, but also larger educational spaces? We might uh, consider um, uh, prison environments, right, as another possibility here. Again, the design of, uh, of those spaces impacts the experience of not just the prisoners, but also the staff that have to manage those facilities. Uh, we might think about space environments, right? Uh, a, a more uh, maybe stranger kind of setting, but uh, groups like NASA would, would consider these kinds of issues. They would think about how the design of uh, space station, shuttle environments impact the experiences of uh, the astronauts that use those spaces. And there are environmental psychologists that uh, do work at NASA and have worked at NASA in the past. We can also broaden this. So, so far, we've really talked about physical spaces, but uh, environments are not just physical spaces, but uh, really what we're talking about is an environment is just uh, any kind of setting where it has information and we have to make sense of that information. So digital environments, virtual environments fit into that category as well. So if we think about our phones, right? Well, that's a, that's an environment, right? There are apps that you interact with. There are, you have to navigate through it in different ways. You have to make sense of that information that's part of that environment. Uh, software uh, that you interact with, right? Also has the, those kinds of features. Virtual reality settings, right? Have that. And increasingly we see environmental psychologists interested in these kinds of spaces as well. We might also think about, um, messages that are present in the environment that suggest certain kinds of behaviors to us, right? So we might be able to manipulate the environment in different ways to generate certain kinds of actions. So these are just examples of, you know, environmental actions, but, right, there's all kinds of other messages uh, or uh, suggestions that environments uh, whisper to us or shout to us about how to act. Uh, so we might look at some of these examples and say, well, there are some informational uh, messages going on in this setting about uh, recycling or, uh, uh, or or landfilling different materials. Clearly, in this example, that has gone wrong, right? Uh, something is wrong with this informational environment. What is that? How could we adjust that so that, uh, in this case, people are, are separating their waste appropriately? What would that look like? We might think about labeling on products that might encourage people to buy more environmentally friendly products. What should those labels look like? How effective is adding environmental content to those labels? Uh, does that actually change consumer behavior or are they actually uh, more concerned with other kinds of signals in the environment? We might uh, be able to implement, uh, some of you might've heard of nudges, right? These kinds of uh, little bits of information in the environment that uh, in the case of the steps, right? Are suggesting a health uh, motive right, for taking the stairs instead of taking an elevator. So again, all of these are ways that we try to manipulate uh, information in the environment to generate a behavior that we think is uh, socially or environmentally desirable in some way. So uh, what, do, what do actually environmental psychologists do? We can be a little bit more precise about that. Uh, I'm going to use some categories that uh, the APA uses to kind of break this down, but uh, these are somewhat artificial categories, so I wouldn't get too caught up in this, but they should give you a sense for the kinds of uh, distinctions that might be helpful. So one way to think about this is looking at uh, how the environment impacts behavior. So that might uh, involve thinking about how different kinds of uh, environments, physical environments, virtual environments, 
uh, other kinds of informational environments uh, can have an impact on, let's say, things like wayfinding or navigation of those spaces, right? Again, you've all been in spaces that were easy to navigate or hard to navigate, and that probably resulted in feelings of comfort or discomfort, right, depending upon those settings. We might think about how those spaces, maybe green spaces or urban spaces, impact health and well-being. Maybe in terms of physical activity or in terms of uh, feelings of anxiety or positive or negative mood states uh, or feelings of stress uh, or our ability to concentrate and focus in those environments, right? Those all might be uh, different depending upon how that setting is designed. We might think about social interaction, right? There are certain spaces that are going to encourage social interaction, make that more likely, uh, and other settings where that's going to it's going to impede that that interaction. Uh, we might think about impacts on productivity, right? Particularly in let's say educational environments or work environments, we might be uh, interested in that. And then we also might think about how the environment. Uh, contributes to things like uh, place attachment or feelings of identity or connection with a specific place uh, and the emotional connection that's built between a person and a particular setting and whether we want to uh, encourage right more positive kinds of connections or more in some cases uh, settings encourage negative connections all of that depends on a huge number of factors right some of it is about the design or the layout of the space itself it could be about the natural features or the amount of built features and the uh, quality of those different features, um, the presence of restorative elements in those settings. We might uh, consider whether environmental stressors are present, uh, things like noise or uh, a large number of other people, right, that might crowd us um, and, and again, produce feelings of maybe stress in some situations. And then we might also think about more uh, individual oriented elements, right? Because this is about an interaction between a person and an environment. We not only think about the environment, but we think about the person and what they're bringing to that space. So they're bringing their prior experience, their expectations about that space, their familiarity with similar spaces in the past. Uh, they might have goals and intentions in mind as they're trying to use that space. So we're looking at both of those things and the interaction between them. Another way to think about this is through the lens of conservation psychology. So this is really gonna be thinking about uh, and asking how we encourage uh, certain kinds of attitudes to be developed around uh, maybe uh, appreciation for nature, but also attitudes for conservation or stewardship of natural resources. So um, part of that is thinking about how we can utilize behavior change tools and strategies to encourage the adoption of uh, more pro-environmental behaviors or environmentally responsible behaviors. So that might be you know, encouraging things like uh, waste reduction or recycling or uh, composting or uh, maybe adopting sustainable food choices, for instance, or sustainable transportation modes, or it could be adopting sustainable energy uh, practices, uh, reducing home energy use, right, could be a focus here. So uh, on one hand, right, we're interested in, uh, in kind of nurturing positive feelings, an affinity towards nature, natural environments, appreciation for conservation, but also the behaviors that lead to that conservation. So both of those at once. Uh, conservation psychology really took maybe the strongest route in educational spaces that are trying to convey these messages. So zoos and aquaria, but uh, it, it really kind of goes beyond that, right? There are certainly, um, uh, Corporate, corporate spaces that are trying to encourage uh, environmentally responsible behavior as well in their employees, right? So this kind of bleeds over into other spaces. So whether or not people have these positive attitudes or engage in these behaviors, again, depends on a whole range of factors that environmental psychologists would want to consider. So they would think about um, your prior experiences with nature, right? How do we create those experiences for others? Uh, in particular, childhood experiences in nature seem like they're especially important for developing that greater appreciation in adulthood. So they might be focused on that. Uh, so that has ties to environmental education. 
um, and uh, kind of building knowledge, awareness, uh, positive attitudes, and also some skills around how to act in environmentally responsible ways. This might also involve thinking about how we communicate environmental messages. How do we frame those message, messages so they resonate with the things that people care about um, and, and motivate them to take action? We might think about a whole range of different behavioral strategies that we could implement to try to encourage people to act in different ways. So that might involve uh, informational messages, but it might also involve things like incorporating behavioral prompts, right? Reminders about how people should act or not act in certain settings. It might involve uh, the use of incentives. Those might be financial incentives, but they could be uh, other kinds of incentives, social incentives or reputational kinds of incentives. Status, right, can be an incentive. So we might think about all of those uh, elements. We might think about uh, social norms and social messaging. So uh, a lot of your behavior is uh, really influenced by what other people are doing around you. So are people tuned in? To what degree are they tuned in to the behavior of others? that might reinforce certain kinds of actions or behaviors. If we think about conservation behaviors, right, there's a whole uh, set of really interesting behaviors that are the, the, uh, the, the normative behavior is hidden from us. An example of that might be like your household energy use, right? Like you don't see what other people do, right? You don't know what, their, what the temperature they're keeping their thermostat at or, uh, whether they're conserving water when they take a shower, right? Those are uh, invisible to you. So there might be uh, opportunities for us to share uh, that normative behavior of others to, to create a different kind of social norm around some of those actions. Uh, and that might cause you to adjust your behavior if you realize, oh, I'm, I'm actually doing something that uh, is far outside of the norm. We might look at things like social support, right? Um, how other people can support one another in making those kinds of changes. So a connection to maybe some social psychology uh, elements, the use of feedback um, their, about their performance and how well they're performing a behavior might have an impact here. Uh, uh, strategies like commitment, right? You uh, commit to taking a certain set of actions. Is that commitment more effective if it's uh, made public to others, for instance? Or how do we design commitments so that they're more likely to be followed through on? Um, so, and there's a whole range of other behavioral uh, techniques and strategies that environmental psychologists would would utilize, uh, and a whole gigantic set of uh, behavioral models with different determinants that they would think about. But we can get into that more if y'all want to. We could also. Uh, see this through the lens of eco-psychology. So the eco-psychology is really focusing on uh, our, our psychological interdependence with nature. It tends to have more of a clinical kind of uh, application to it. Uh, so focusing really much more uh, directly on this kind of emotional response or emo emotional connection to nature and how do we leverage that uh, to support health, well-being, recovery in different settings. So nature is, is being used as a clinical tool or a therapeutic tool. Uh, there's a whole number of ways that uh, uh, eco-psychologists do that through things like horticulture therapy, working with plants and gardening to try to support health and healing and well-being um, in a variety of settings. We might look at animal assisted therapies uh, using uh, dogs and cats and birds and sometimes horses uh, to try to, again, uh, achieve certain clinical, clinically relevant outcomes for different populations. Uh, the same idea with wilderness therapy, right? We might take people out into wilderness to help them deal with uh, maybe some uh, social dysfunction that they're having or some emotional trauma that they've experienced um, and help them recover and heal from that by being immersed in nature as part of the therapeutic process. Uh, care farming is another example of this. Uh, basically it involves spending time in uh, farm environments, working on the farm, growing plants, interacting with animals as a way to build self-confidence, self-esteem, um, recover from uh, maybe some uh, other issues. Uh, it's much more widely accepted in Europe than it is in the US, although it's starting to gain a little bit of traction here as well. 
Um, and they, uh, eco psychologists would also be interested in things like the impacts of environmental change or environmental disruption. So uh, the idea of eco anxiety or ecological grief, uh, these kind of traumatic experiences that that are generated when uh, the environment experiences some trauma itself, and how that kind of gets passed on uh, to us. And then we could also think about a more recent kind of uh, example of this, which is uh, climate psychology. Uh, so this really focuses much more directly on psychological responses to climate change itself. Uh, climate psychologists might be interested in mental health impacts of climate change, uh, things like climate anxiety that uh, is seemingly much more uh, common today than it has been in the past. Uh, the impacts of climate related disasters on people's uh, social and emotional functioning. So if you experience a severe, let's say a heat event, uh, that takes a, a toll on people's mental health. Uh, and there are particularly vulnerable communities that experience even greater impacts from that. So climate psychologists might uh, work with other health professionals to try to really understand and appreciate uh, and try to mitigate the impacts of, of those events. Same thing for drought events or flood events or severe storms, right? Many of these events result in displacement of populations. And we, uh, we know that displacement has a huge impact on social, emotional, uh, psychological health in different ways. So how do you how do you help people cope with those kinds of settings was a question that uh, climate psychologists would, would think about. And also this idea of solastalgia, which is that um, people can also experience trauma from uh, witnessing the uh, uh, a change in their environment. So the idea is that uh, people can feel uh, impacts that are similar to displacement of being physically relocated from an environment, but they haven't actually been physically relocated. Instead, what's happened is that the surrounding environment has changed to a point where it's um, unrecognizable to people, that it um, it's, it's no longer a setting that they feel like is home or is comfortable to them. The touchstones of their typical experience are no longer present, and that's deeply disturbing to people. Uh, so uh, that's increasingly kind of being a focus of some climate psychologists as well. They might also look at reasons why people might uh, be resistant to accepting climate change or be apathetic towards taking action around uh, climate change. Uh, they would look at how we communicate climate change right to other people to try to motivate them and not to just frighten them to death and cause them to, to withdraw and not take action. We might also think about how you might go about building uh, individual psychological resilience in people so that they can cope more effectively with events that are very likely to happen in the future. Or how do we build uh, social resilience within communities so that they can absorb these shocks that are likely to come and, and again, um, deal with them more effectively. So we have a, a range of things there. I mentioned also uh, population psychology. That's something that uh, uh, the American Psychological Association kind of lumps in with environmental psychology. Uh, it's basically this idea that uh, uh, increasing population, population density places pressures on natural systems and the environment. And it's kind of the, the study of that. So population psychologists might be interested in doing things like uh, you know, looking at how do we kind of reduce birth rates or uh, implement family planning to give people more reproductive control. Um, so uh, there is some connection there. That starts to kind of bleed into some other fields that are, it's probably a more comfortable fit, but population psychology just kind of got uh, lumped into environmental psychology out of uh, a number of other reasons. But sometimes you might hear that come up as well. So where do environmental psychologists work? Um, it's going to be a whole range of places that they work. Uh, some of those, and probably most commonly, you see them working in nonprofits or non-governmental organizations. So this might be, you know, uh, your traditional environmental organizations like uh, Environmental Defense Fund or the World Wildlife Fund or the Sierra Club or Natural Resources Defense Council or National Wildlife Federation, right? Uh, all of these groups probably have individuals that have um, some background in environmental psychology. Uh, you also, and by the way, there are other uh, nonprofits that 
might not be uh, what you would typically think of as environmental nonprofits, but they have uh, a connection with uh, environments uh, where environmental psychologists can lend their expertise. So later in my list here, it says uh, things like the Land Trust Institute or Smart Growth America. These are nonprofits that are focused on really thinking about how do we plan and build communities in ways that um, uh, support health and well-being of populations. So that's you know very different than the Sierra Club, but uh, but they have uh, similar kind of goals about uh, how do we design environments. Uh, zoos and aquarium, any kind of environmental uh, group that's trying to uh, communicate educational messages about the environment might employ uh, environmental psychologists to do that. Uh, and then there are groups like the United Nations, right, which are concerned about uh, the, all these issues that we've been talking about. Um, and also some groups like uh, Pew Charitable Trusts, uh, Pew Research Center, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that uh, have interests that overlap with environmental psychology. So they uh, fund projects or are interested in projects that might uh, broadly be interested in how do we support population health. Well, uh, thinking about the environment is certainly one way to do that. Uh, government agencies would also be a place that environmental psychologists uh, work. These might be more local kinds of efforts. So the Office of Sustainability in different municipal departments, the city of Ann Arbor has a Office of Sustainability. Uh, I know that it employs some people that have some background and training in environmental psychology, but you might also think about local health departments, right? They might be interested in these uh, kinds of uh, expertise or local planning commissions uh, might benefit from this. Uh, state departments of natural resources uh, are trying to not only implement programs about how they manage these, uh, these uh, public lands, but also how do we communicate with the public? How do we uh, create community outreach about, uh, about projects that are going on or what's happening in these spaces, right? That's fertile ground for environmental psychologists. Uh, federal uh, agencies like the EPA would certainly be uh, aligned or the US Forest Service or even groups like the CDC. Uh, so a whole range of different uh, uh, agencies. And then uh, the private sector as well. So uh, there are gonna be some opportunities in more design oriented fields and professions, things uh, like uh, uh, urban planning, uh, architecture, interior design would certainly uh, overlap, but also uh, corporate sustainability offices, again, that are trying to encourage uh, the adoption of more sustainable behaviors um, in their employees or in other processes that they're engaged in, uh, right? That is always a communication challenge. And again, environmental psychologists hopefully have something to say about that. Uh, just to give you a sense of, uh, uh, some career examples. I think this would be really helpful because it might help you just get a sense of a model for the kinds of career paths or career trajectories that uh, folks that have a background in environmental psychology follow. So I'll do a couple examples first that are uh, PhD examples, but uh, and then I'll do a, a bunch that are also folks that have master's degrees. All of these individuals are what I would probably classify as like mid-career environmental psychologists. So I'll try to walk you through like, you know, their undergrad and what they did after that and and, and what they're doing now. So uh, Laura Cole, she is uh, received her PhD here at the University of Michigan. All of these folks have a Michigan connection because I know them. Um, she is currently an assistant professor at Colorado State University. Her uh, undergrad degree was in environmental design she, uh, after undergrad, Laura worked at an interior design firm, I believe in Chicago, I think. Uh, it was a very large interior design firm. She later came back to do a master's of science in architecture, and then later a PhD in architecture and uh, natural resources. Uh, so both of those. She's worked at uh, in interior architecture at UNC Greenboro and uh, in the Arch architectural studies department in at the University of Missouri. So a strong kind of uh, design background for Laura. Uh, her current research involves using buildings as teaching tools. How do we use the, the elements of buildings to teach uh, individuals about sustainability or to support STEM education? 
So she's looking at things like green roofs and building curriculum around using uh, this particular type of green infrastructure to communicate STEM concepts in science curriculum. Uh, she's looking at outdoor classrooms and how they can support uh, energy education and complement, again, uh, STEM curriculum. Uh, she has a project right now looking at uh, a virtual learning game around green building practices. So again, uh, very strong focus on the built settings and interactions with natural settings. Uh, Kim Wolski is another uh, PhD example here. She's currently a research associate professor at the University of Chicago. Kim uh, did her uh, bachelor's degree in environmental studies at Connecticut College, and then she went on to focus on environmental education in her master's program and then a PhD in environmental psychology. She previously did some consulting work for Opower, uh, who's a, a company that consults with uh, utilities to try to communicate uh, energy use and reduce energy use for household consumers. So they're, they're thinking about how do we show people their energy usage so that it lowers right, their uses and place less demands on the utility. She also was a research fellow at the Herb Institute and energy commissioner at the, Center, uh, the city of Ann Arbor. And uh, her uh, main focus right now is thinking about consumer perceptions of rooftop solar and how to lower barriers for solar adoption uh, amongst low and middle income consumers. She might also she also looks at things like, you know, how do you get households to invest in energy efficiency upgrades to their home, right? Uh, putting insulation into their homes, for instance, or, or other kinds of uh, uh, things like that. Some uh, just PhD or I'm sorry, uh, master's degree examples. Um, the first one we can look at is Chris Stratman. He um, is currently the director of community collaboration at Kiwit Luminarium. Uh, uh, that is a uh, science museum in Omaha that has interactive exhibits around physics, biology, engineering, ecology. Uh, he's looking at community outreach and engagement, uh, especially for underserved groups. How do you kind of get them to use this space uh, that's for the community? Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in, in, in psychology, actually, uh, from St. John's University. After undergrad, uh, Chris worked in a job, I believe, coordinating urban planning and engineering project teams and doing public and community outreach on various projects. Uh, he did his master's uh, at uh, CES here at the University of Michigan. And after that, uh, worked as a sustainability consultant. Um, basically assessing employee engagement of organizational culture around sustainability uh, initiatives in healthcare settings, higher education, zoos and aquaria. Uh, and he was also executive director of Keep Omaha Beautiful, which was uh, is an uh, environmental organization that conducts environmental education and service learning projects for students. Erica, uh, who you see here, is Senior Director of Operations at Blue Water Baltimore. That is an environmental nonprofit that advocates for protection and restoration of waterways around Baltimore. Her bachelor's degree was in wildlife research, management, and education. Uh, and after undergrad, I believe Erica worked as a conservation education intern at Walt Disney and then uh, as a research consultant at the US Forest Service, uh, examining environmental education programs in Chicago and Milwaukee. And then she came, did her master's degree. And after her master's, she worked as an environmental coordinator in uh, an environmental center in Elkhart, Indiana. She developed, uh, delivered environmental education programming, worked on fundraising, managed volunteer programs for uh, the environmental center. She worked um, also is the uh, environmental center supervisor for the city of Elkhart, so a more municipal kind of position, um, which was leading the creation of an environmental center for the city and managing staff operations uh, in different ways. And she later became the director of engagement for the West Michigan Environmental Action Council, which was all about developing climate change communication strategies uh, and training tools uh, for communities in West Michigan. Uh, Sarah, 
told you I'd give you all lots of examples here. Uh, so Sarah is currently the sustainability program manager at the city of Cedar Rapids. She is working to implement community the community climate action plan to reduce carbon emissions in uh, the city of Cedar Rapids, uh, encouraging things like active transportation, sustainable food choices, all those kinds of things. She uh, got her bachelor's degree in journalism and Russian and Eastern European history, uh, very different kind of thing. And after undergrad, uh, she worked as an account executive in advertising and marketing, so nothing to do with journalism. Uh, went and did her master's here at uh, University of Michigan, interned at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, and developed educational and training materials for them. Uh, also worked as a program coordinator uh, for the Great Lakes uh, Observing System, working on marketing and educational materials for them, and as a project manager and uh, interim director for the Office of Sustainability at the University of Iowa. So implementing sustainability efforts on the Iowa University of Iowa campus. And then Diana Porter, a little bit different. She is currently a Youth Mental Health Policy Fellow at the Sitka Conservation Society in Alaska. She studies uh, youth and workforce development programs that focus on integrating nature and cultural practices to increase the effectiveness of those workforce education programs. She uh, got her bachelor's degree in psychology uh, and environmental studies. Uh, after undergrad, I think she worked at the Student Conservation Association and interned with a land trust in Montana uh, came back and did her master's in uh, uh, behavior education and communication at uh, University of Michigan, and also did a master's in clinical mental health counseling. She worked as a, uh, uh, a program associate and manager at the Meridian Institute uh, after doing that, where she was facilitating uh, community dialogues between different groups around environmental policies, trying to do conflict resolution for them, build consensus around projects. And then she also worked as a uh, recovery coach, facilitating group therapy and wilderness therapy, uh, adventure therapy programs. Um, so she has a very different kind of uh, focus, right? Much more kind of clinical uh, background to what she's doing. I also included here some resources that you all can take a look at. There is our active links. Uh, the APA has some information about uh, environmental psychology uh, tracks and careers through Division 34, which is the specific APA division that focuses on environmental and conservation psychology. Uh, the um, International Association of Applied Psychology, Division 4, is also focused specifically on environmental psychology. So it has more information about environmental psychology. Again, both of those are probably going to be more academically oriented, uh, but they could help you get a better sense for, again, kind of career paths, uh, professions, uh, expertise that uh, environmental psychologists have. These two um, Associations, the Environmental Design Research Association and the Interna International Association for People Environmental Studies are professional organizations uh, that hold conferences uh, for both academics and professionals in the field of environmental psychology. So uh, they could be useful resources as well. There's a, also an article with a link there uh, at the bottom of that slide that provides a guide to graduate education in environmental psychology. It's a little bit dated from 2010, but I believe most of the programs are still still active and up to date. So it uh, provides a little overview of uh, if you're interested in getting uh, a graduate degree of some kind in environmental psychology, it lists a bunch of uh, uh, institutions there that have either certification or degree programs. And then there are some other interesting resources that could be uh, useful to look at that are more nonprofits that deal with some of these issues. So Project for Public Spaces is one of those. Again, a more design-oriented uh, kind of application. They're advocating for incorporating public spaces into urban environments. They use a lot of research uh, in the field of environmental psychology to support that. Uh, the Center for Behavior and the Environment, RARE there, is really focused on encouraging more sustainable behaviors in different populations and the strategies that we use to, to try to do that. 
Uh, and then the Climate Psychology Alliance and the Climate Mental Health Network are both organizations that are dealing with uh, how people relate to and adapt to climate change psychologically, how it impacts their mental health. Um, and again, they have a lot of relevant uh, elements there as well. So I think that's the end of my slides. That was a lot. Um, so I will stop there and in the last few minutes, just give you all a chance to ask questions if you have any or Or Julie can ask me questions if anybody's shy. Yeah, I think the only thing that we had in the chat was just to make sure that um, the the Google document that you shared had open access. I will make sure that that is the case. Yeah, thank you. I think that was the only thing that came up in the chat. But I really appreciate that you showed the different examples with the resumes of like the different types of um, career trajectories that students can, can go in. But it, I just like, just to clarify, I guess, to make sure or that it looked like the majority of people did move on to a master's degree. Would you say yeah, that's correct? Yeah, I think that's accurate. I think that um, one of the things to maybe keep in mind is that there are there really isn't any undergrad focused programs that are specifically on environmental psychology. What's much more likely is that you have a few courses that are part of a larger major that might touch on environmental psychology in different ways. Um, so typically what you see is people get a little bit of exposure to some of the ideas and concepts, and then they go on to do a master's degree to strengthen some of those, uh, uh, some of those skills and capabilities and that understanding. Um, and even, I would say even within master's degree programs, you're typically talking about uh, probably not a master's degree program that's specifically on environmental psychology, but it's probably, you know, like, um, some of the examples there said their their master's degree was in uh, uh, behavior, uh, yeah, behavior education and communication, right? So they're actually doing coursework across a lot of different issues and areas. Environmental psychology might be one element of that, but they might also be taking courses in policy uh, or environmental education or right some other uh, aspects as well. Generally, you don't get to really intense coursework in environmental psychology until you get to the PhD level. That's really where you're going to spend the bulk of your time doing that. Does that help, Julie? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, and I guess my only other question to help some, maybe some undergraduates, like as far as like trying to get involved with research, like I know there's definitely some potential research opportunities within the psych department, but I don't know if there's anything else within um, the program for the environment or anything else that, you know, undergraduates could potentially do to strengthen any sort of application for master's degrees or PhD programs. Yeah, I, so I guess my broad, so I can give you specific advice. Uh, probably the individual that's doing the most direct work around uh, environmental psychology issues right now is Ray DeYoung. He runs the environmental psychology lab uh, in SEAS. Um, but uh, I would say that really any research experience uh, that has some of these elements, and that might be in the psych department, it might be uh, focused on environmental policy, it could be focused on education and communication, any of those experiences, I think, could uh, would would look positively for people that are applying to other programs. So I wouldn't necessarily feel like you have to get the you know specific position with you know a person that's studying this. Uh, instead, I would think about like maybe uh, looking for opportunities that complement some of the, the elements of that field, right? So that might be. Uh, projects that are trying to understand environmental attitudes or uh, uh, environmental communications and what makes effective messaging. So, right, the psychology department, communications department certainly have folks that 
that deal with those kinds of issues. And they may not even necessarily have to be about environmental issues specifically. And then within uh, program the environment and CEUs, right, there are individuals that focus on things like uh, like p- policy, right? I mean, policy isn't done in a vacuum, right? They have to communicate with the public. They have to figure out how to uh, implement those policies in different places. Right? Again, those are great lessons to take uh, into programs of uh, environmental psychology. Yeah, thanks that so help, much. Julie? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I just put in the chat the link to the psych department website where we have all of the list of uh, current researchers and labs where you can um, delve a little bit more into uh, research within the psych department. So we have those links there. The, uh, the, other, th- but, the other thing yeah. that I would just quickly add is that um, from the examples, I hope that this was something that you all noticed is that there were a couple of them that had backgrounds in psych, uh, and there's nothing wrong with having a background in psych. That'll certainly be beneficial, but uh, that's not a necessity. So you might be coming at these issues from a different perspective, or you may not even come to these uh, interests until you do a master's degree. That That's okay. Um, you, know, you can develop these uh, understandings and expertise without necessarily having a, done an undergrad degree in psychology. I mean, again, it would be helpful. It would certainly probably give you a little bit of a head start on some concepts, but uh, not essential. I think my undergrad experience was a, a one general psych course. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Does anybody have any other questions? We just got a couple more minutes left. Trying to think if I had anything else. Well, I'll just fill time, you know, if y'all just want to stick around. I think the other uh, thing that I would say about the field overall is that uh, it, I think it tends to be appealing to people because it's a very applied field. You know, it deals with real world problems that we're struggling with and we need to make progress on. And um, I think for many people that feels maybe meaningful or empowering in a way that maybe some other uh, career paths don't always have. (laughs) So, uh, that's also something to think about. Well, I don't know if we have any 